buttons on this stupid thing. All right. Onwards and upwards in our classes. So, today we're making a clean break. You guys took a test on Friday, so we're ready to move on to our next class. And I'm going to use this word class really loosely because those of you who have already started um, on your species accounts know that the word or the phrase class osteophys is actually not used taxonomically anymore. Um, but we're going to continue to use it because it's really useful. Um, as we compare our chondrophies and osteophys. So I'm going to mention the new taxonomy now as we're sort of introducing this and talk about it and talk about why taxonomy can be quite frustrating. And then we're going to continue to use um, the old naming system because, quite frankly, it's so much easier. <clears throat> so the way we've been talking about this up to this stage, so remember, we originally looked at our two umbrellas, right? We had our agnatha, right, which were our jawless fishes, and we saw these as our early fishes. Remember, these were things like our hagfish and our lamprey. Okay, so these were first. So this is oldest. Bless you. Okay. So we can kind of break that into two groups. Whereas everything down from here, we can group them into the nathostomata. Remember the having jaws. <clears throat> And the first group we looked at within this umbrella were our chondrichthys. And our cartilaginous fishes. Okay, remember we looked at these with two parts. Synapomorphies. Remember, synapomorphies are same traits. So these are things that we would see perpetuating or melting all the way through. Everybody we see continuing forward. And then we had unique traits, right? Traits that made chondrichthys their own special group, right? And then chondrichthys had their own two subclasses. Holocephali, the ratfishes, and elasmobranchii, sharks, skates, and rays. So now we're ready to look at our second class, which is much bigger, right? Where chondrichthys was the smallest of all of our classes, at about 900, right? Osteichthys, <coughs> gracious, osteichthys, as even this like imagery is breaking down for us, is one of the largest. Right, at about 25,000 and growing species. Okay. Now, classically, this has been defined as having two subclasses as well, as we'll find. Right, the very, very hard ones to say, Actinopterygii, right, being most of the fishes, and where we'll spend most of our time, and then the Sarcopterygii. <clears throat> okay, so my word of caution. This is how we will talk about this. It will be the easiest to discuss, right? Particularly because our chondrichthys, remember, means cartilaginous. Right? Osteichthys meaning bony. Okay? And this also gives us the subclasses and all of that business. Okay? As you go through your species accounts, if you choose bony fishes, you're going to find that taxonomists have reorganized bony fishes. I have the, 
can't, I don't even have it up here. It's a total nightmare. <clears throat> so what you will find is that osteoarthritis has been retired. Okay, or it's considered a dead clade. So it'll still be listed there. Okay. And largely what this has to do with is diversity. Right? So we've gotten so many fishes. Okay, we filled in that taxonomy so much that everything's kind of been lifted up. Right? So our subclasses, Actinopterygii and Sarcopterygii, have been promoted, if you will, to class. And all of the things underneath them have then also been promoted. But this happens from time to time with taxonomy as we discover more creatures. Okay, it becomes harder and harder to fill in sort of the sandwiched or book-ended spaces in between. Right, so then everything kind of has to move out. <clears throat> I don't care that you know any of this. Right? This is the simple way of understanding it. helps us understand things based on traits. Just stick with this. I hate taxonomists. Right, they're all kind of very specific, over-the-top people. Right, I just want you to know, if you get into this with your species accounts and it feels confusing, this is why you're seeing different information. Okay, it's happened in the last five years. Sometimes this stuff goes back and forth, which is why I've not bothered to incorporate it in the class because I hate fixing it and then putting it back. Okay. So if it's bugging you, let me know. We'll sit down and go through it. But for now, we're just, just going to, this isn't me being a fuddy-duddy, right? We're just going to stick with it until they're for sure that that's the way it's going to go. Then I'll worry about it. <clears throat> okay, so for now, we're going to stick with class osteoxys, right? It's telling us they're bony fishes, and we can work with their subgroups because it's very intuitive. It helps us work with them as groups. How do you say the word next to osteoxys? You teleostomize. Right, so remember, true, so we're looking at true fishes. Mm. That's another term that you might see. <clears throat> Fish people are about as weird as bird people. I don't know what happens to people when you study one thing for too long, but... Okay, <clears throat> so the first thing we want to talk about is something called the dawn of the fishes. Okay. So we know that there is a lot of diversity in fishes. Okay. So the dawn of the fishes is a very specific era in time that's going to give us some insight as to why. Okay. Why are we seeing such an unusual amount of diversity, both just in our osteichthys, right, with 25,000 species, but also with fishes in general, right, because we have these agnathans and the nathostoma, and we have the agnathans, the chondrichthys, gracious, and our osteichthys. So this is quite a substantial amount of diversity to be seen in kind of like one specific place. So our time period, or what makes up the age of the fishes, right, so here we are, okay, is quite old. Okay, what we call the Devonian period. Okay, so here's what you guys are probably a little more familiar with, right? Late time of dinosaurs. Okay, so this is much, much older than that. <clears throat> okay. So we're talking about the Devonian period. Okay. We're talking about a very early period, much earlier than organisms are largely roaming the land for. Okay. So our Carboniferous period here is largely where we saw a bloom of plants on land. Okay, woody plants, for example, came about in the Carboniferous period. Yeah, that might have been a click. Nope, just losing my mind. We're all good. <clears throat> so right before that, we have what's called the Age of the Fishes. Okay, so as in part, not surprising, 
Okay, one of the key here is, is the major niche or the major habitat we have is water. Okay, so this is where the bulk of our organisms are, is in the water. Okay, so we see here, okay, with this sort of unusual graphic that we're looking at, okay, in addition to time, this has started to break down our organisms for us. So the first thing we see is, as of yet, right, we don't have any, any terrestrial organisms, or at least the ones we're familiar with. And that makes sense, right, as I said, it's not until the Carboniferous period that we really have any good habitat, right, plants, et cetera, on land. Right? So there's nothing really for them to eat or live in. Okay, so here we see... Okay, that big bulk, okay, that huge expansion okay, of many different, here's our jawlet, well, maybe X's are not a good thing to use. Okay, here's our jawless, cartilaginous, okay, fishes you maybe haven't heard of, okay, as well as our two subspecies. Okay, so these are both osteichthys. Okay, your ray finned fishes, okay, are the fishes you normally think of being fishes, right, the actinopterygiis, okay, 90% of your fish diversity, and we can see this ultimately expands, right, into 90% of your fish diversity, trout, guppies, blah, 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 okay, so this is the first group, okay, as well as the second subgroup, okay, those so we're going to have actually, I'm going to have an example here of what makes things expand. So it depends, but usually where we see these big events is an extinction event that triggers that. So great lead in. Okay. So. The question is, why do we see big expansions in diversity, like the one we had at top, or where we have the Devonian era, where we have just a whole bunch of things living their best lives? Okay, so the answer is usually because something bad happens. Okay, so remember, in any period, so remember here we are, a bajillion million years ago, okay, normally if we remember our conversation about niche, Everything is about competition. So everything is living its best life, but we're fighting over a very limited set of resources, wherever that is. Okay, so remember when we talk about niche, okay, realize we're fundamental. Okay, we talked about this being an organism's place in the world over a very limited resource. We talked about like the dorm room niche, right, that realized niche. Okay, I may be able to use or want more things, okay, but I'm stuck cooking ramen in an electric kettle, whatever the case is. Okay, because there's something bigger than me, okay, better at getting whatever than me, okay, has bigger teeth than me, okay, and that's going to continue to be the case. And particularly when we're talking about the ocean, okay, Fishes and even vertebrates were not the biggest game on the planet. So what ends up happening is during these time periods, and here during the Devonian time period, so we saw about like midway through the Devonian, we started to see these expansions in that graphic, is something caused, okay, a stage clearing. Okay, so through time we have several, okay, in fact five, major extinction events. We kind of only ever picture the one, round dead dinosaurs, right? Okay, but this happened more than the one time. Okay, so in this case, okay, bad news occurred in the oceans. <clears throat> okay. In particular, there's a, there's a bunch of research that shows some, several oceanic volcanoes going off. 
which dumps a bunch of sulfur and carbon dioxide directly into the ocean. <clears throat> okay, creating both ocean anoxia, right, so there's less oxygen in the ocean. And then, of course, as those volcanoes go off, right, they're dumping magma, which then becomes lava, which then becomes land, right? So we're actually losing a lot of ocean during this time period. There's a lot of tectonic plate activity that's causing this. So what we end up doing is offing a bunch of organisms that are in the ocean. And a lot of these cases, as we'll find when we talk about this throughout the semester, is it's pretty selective inadvertently. So species or families or classes that are more vulnerable are more likely to die, which in this case tends to be organisms that are jawless because they have more trouble finding food, right? They're scavenger based, right? And most of their food ends up dead or buried or covered in molten rock, sucks, right? As well as invertebrates. Right, because of the way invertebrates breathe, right, largely through things like diffusion. Now that the whole ocean is covered in sulfur, not super great, right, so they're much more limited. So the ground that was covered in like large, angry, giant scorpions, okay, insects and invertebrates who were largely dominating and had been dominating the ocean floor up to this point, okay, did not do as great of a job surviving these conditions, okay? When all of these guys died, okay, the individuals that did live, right, are larger jawed vertebrates that were able to move around, okay, and hunt more actively, were more likely to survive. Okay, as a result, they were better equipped to live in this what for them must have looked like a post-apocalyptic universe. Okay, but they were able to continue to live and continue to then dominate okay, what were now empty niches or emptier niches. It's a form of natural selection, yeah. Just a really quick, brutal version. So a lot of the diversity that we have in fishes comes from this particular period. Okay, feel good? Okay, so this is where our fishes are coming from. Late Devonian apocalyptic mm, volcanoes. So now let's look at what makes our Osteichthyes what they are. Holy Monday. Okay, so remember we want to break this into two parts. Our first part is synapomorphy. So remember, synapomorphies are shared characteristics, right? These are traits that not only do bony fishes have, right, but this is something all populations from here on out will have. Okay, so fishes will have this, amphibians will have this, reptiles will have this, birds will have this. Right, this is a shared evolutionary trait. Okay, so trait number one, okay, as their name implies, and one we've been waiting for, right, the bony skeleton. Okay, so we've been building on, and this has been one of the main themes we've been working with since day one, right, reinforcement of that support stru structure. Started with the notochord, and then we added vertebral elements. Then we added an expansion of those vertebral elements with connections. And now we've gone ahead and committed. 
So we have a clear expansion of all of those vertebral elements. Okay, we have vertebrae, we have the notochord, we can see all of those pieces. So now we're just going to commit. And everything's going to be reinforced with that calcium phosphate. Okay, so now we have a lot, a lot of support and connections. Remember, the key behind having support and connections is the more support we have, right, the more places you have for muscle connections. Okay, and now right, we have all of these extra places, too, that are tough for protection, right? So we kind of remember this when we were working with our fishes. Right, we have those ribs that came down. Those are good for muscles. Okay, and they're also good for protecting all of those organs we wanted to get at. Okay, it keeps the heart safe, that swim bladder safe. Right, so one bite or one puncture is much less likely, at least, to be a complete um, death warrant. Okay, that's it. That's our only synapomorphism. We only have one to remember this time. Okay, so osteophys are only adding one shared characteristic. It's a super important one, but it's only one. And this is compared to our chondrichthys that gave us six. I said with a lot of confidence. Okay, so now we're immediate. The whole kind of thing kind of shook. I don't know what happened here. Okay, we're immediately going to break our fishes down into our two subclasses. Because right, actinopterygii and sarcopterygii are pretty different. Okay, long word. Okay, so we're going to work on the pronunciation again, right? Act in opt er, ridge ei. Everybody ready? Here we go. Three, two, one. Act in opt ridge ei. Looks nothing like it's spelled. I don't make this stuff up. All right. So remember when we're looking at actinopterygii? Hey, when we're talking about these guys, these are what we think of when we think of fishes. Okay, and this is why we're going to start with this. So the vast majority of our fishes, the vast majority of that 25,000 count fish diversity, is coming from this group. So this is really what we want to talk about. We want to look at the fish biology that's going into this, right? So there's so much diversity that's looking at this subclass. And we're just going to keep calling it a subclass. All right. <clears throat> or think this is maybe how, right, so this is how you might see it if you're doing your species account, right, where they're calling osteoclase a super class and that actinopterygii is a regular class. Right, so this is the way we kind of also want to be very aware of. Okay, but keep in mind, right, all of these other pieces are not changing. Right, we're still in domain, eukarya, right, kingdom, Animalia. Our phylum is still chordata. Our subphylum sub is still vertebrata, right? If we're in those levels, right, that means we still have all of those traits. 
Out of all of the traits that make me a chordate, all of the traits that make me a vertebrate, right? I'm still a nathostome. They haven't talked about what level that is because they've talked about plates and stuff, and it's really gross. Taxonomy people are really gross, okay? We know I have a jaw. And so we don't want to lose track of these. Remember, we want to think of these things like umbrellas. Right? And the synapomorphies within that umbrella fall down. Right? Like rain under that umbrella. So everything under that umbrella has to have all of those synapomorphies. Make it rain synapomorphies. That's the new one, correct. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes, we want to keep track of them. That's correct. Okay, so let's talk about our class or our subclass, Actinopterygia. So we call these the ray-finned fishes. This is the kind of fish your gray perch was, your Mexican gray perch. So they're called ray-finned for a reason. And as we look at... their pectoral or pelvic fin. So we can kind of picture this when we were handling their pectoral fins last week or the week before. I'm trying to remember when we were all together again. Okay. And we remember, right, they kind of feel like they had webbing between really tough kind of sticks or ribs. Okay, these are the rays they're talking about. Here I'm calling them spines. Okay, so they're all starting at that joint and coming out in these spines or this rayness. This is where their name comes from. So they all kind of have like a business. Exactly kind of what we classically imagine a fish has. So this is going to be distinctly different from the other groups. This is the key defining feature here. Okay, so this is how we kind of imagine the key fin of a fish being. Okay? And this is indeed how most of them are, right? So 99% of what we're picturing are osteoclis being have little fins like this. Yeah, regardless of whether they're in the ocean or a pond, right? Tuna fish, okay, trout, does not matter. Okay. Eels have fins like this. They're just teeny. Okay. They're all there. They all look just like this. Okay, just like your perch had last, uh, last week for some of you, two weeks for some of the others. Okay. So we will start breaking down. Our Actinopterygii on Wednesday. Okay, as always, um, when you're all completed, my back two rows may go. Let's see if I'm recording this stuff.
Okay.